many thanks to Andrew for those remarks, uh, particularly the ones that were true. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for coming out on this uh, cold evening, and I hope the snow squall doesn't um, <coughs> hit us while we're here. Um, it, it's a thrill for me to be able to, to share what I think is a, is a really exciting time in the study of human evolution. Things are moving fast because of what's happening in genetics, what's happening in neurobiology and physiology, and all sorts of the areas. And, what I want to do is to, to share a, a new perspective on uh, how we became human, as well as a problem of aggression. The paradox uh, referred to in the uh, title of my book is the fact that, in comparison to other species, in many ways we are exceptionally nonviolent, And yet, at the same time, we are also exceptionally violent. I will elaborate on that point. What it means is <coughs> that uh, we have a tussle between two kinds of views. One kind of view is represented by uh, the Rousseauians, people who believe that they're following uh, the precepts of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, which is the idea that our evolved tendency, our natural evolutionary psychology, uh, is, places us for non-aggression. <clears throat> In that case, the reason that we are aggressive sometimes is that we are corrupted by society. And the other view is that uh, we have an evolved natural tendency to be competitive and aggressive and violent in <coughs> the style of Thomas Hobbes. And in that case, uh, we are civilized by society. So if we have a single scale of aggression, there's a paradox. Well, what are we doing lying at both ends of this? So that's one question I want to, to get to grips with. The other question <coughs> may not seem at first to be closely tied. And that is that when we take the various species in the genus Homo, then why is it that one of them became us? So in order to get into that, um, I want to, uh, to remind some of you uh, about uh, where we are in human evolution. So just to get a, a quick introduction to, uh, to the pattern, um, here is the pattern of relationships among ourselves and the great apes as revealed by uh, genetics. So since 1984, we've known this very surprising thing that humans emerge from within the tree that contains chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas. And that indicates that our ancestor, which we can date to something like seven to nine million years ago, was uh, in the chimpanzee, bonobo, gorilla mold. And, and various pieces of evidence suggest that it's rather more like a chimpanzee than anything else. And then we have uh, four or five million years of uh, ancestors who were called australopithecines and uh, are basically chimpanzees standing upright and uh, with slightly bigger teeth. They're about chimpanzee-sized, and they were still probably sleeping in trees, and they have certainly got <coughs> big brawny arms that enable them to uh, do well in the trees. So it's, the last point is the one I want to focus on, <coughs> and this is the genus Homo. So the genus Homo begins something around two million years ago. It depends exactly how you define it. And the big picture is that most people would say that Homo erectus is the first sort of significant member of our, our genus. Uh, this is the one that I could go into Harvard Square and, and pick clothes off the peg, and if you can find a clothes shop there, and uh, <clears throat> unlike any other species. And then, uh, uh, eventually, uh, starting around 300,000 years ago, we have a species that we call Homo sapiens, represented here, of course, by the erstwhile president of Harvard. And uh, the big picture uh, it gets confusing when we go into the middle of this era, the two million years of the Pleistocene, because there's a bunch of species that we don't really have uh, any sort of very clear understanding of exactly how they should be named, but uh, they consist of a series of rather robustly boned uh, and still quite big-brained uh, species uh, represented here by the president of Yale. So the question that I want to ask is, uh, what happened uh, about uh, 300,000 years ago? Uh, and uh, here is a, a representation of, uh, of that, that early human uh, by uh, Elizabeth Dynez. Uh, I want to look at, uh, at three things that, uh, that changed about this time. First of all, uh, there were some anatomical changes. On the left, what you see is the skull of an individual from about 600,000 years ago. And you see some extremely robust ridges above the eye, those brow ridges. 
which are becoming a little bit reduced by the time you get to the uh, species that uh, most people are now thinking uh, represents a very early form of Homo sapiens uh, at uh, Jebel Hood in, in Morocco. Uh, it's got lesser brow ridge, it's got a shorter face, it's got smaller molars, all of which are trends in the direction that is then sort of fully realized as uh, Homo sapiens uh, by, say, 200,000 years ago. And, and here you've got uh, uh, one of those early specimens uh, with, a, uh, by that time, a rounded brain case, which people used to think was defining Homo sapiens, and now it seems coming in during Homo sapiens. Of course, these are just arbitrary definitions about names, but anyway, you, you get the sort of general trajectory here. So that's some of the anatomical changes. And then at the same time, you're getting some archaeological changes. Uh, so uh, somewhere around 300,000 years ago, uh, that's when you get this, uh, what's been called a, a sleek new toolkit. And, and what that means is that instead of these uh, rather crude hand axes on the left, uh, you see a whole series of uh, more subtle, smaller, uh, more effective tools on the right made by a new kind of technique that it demands a lot of foreplanning, the Lavalois technique. And at the same time, uh, you're getting some uh, evidence of larger social networks, either uh, single groups uh, occupying larger areas or uh, more trade among groups, uh, because the uh, obsidian that is sourced in the particular study that showed this best, uh, Logosile in Kenya, uh, can come from as much as 100 kilometers away. Very rare occasion uh, before 300,000 years ago. And then you, some of you might be able to see on the bottom right stones uh, a little bit of red, uh, and now we're getting for the first time the symbolic representation apparently uh, represented by the use of red ochre. So if anatomy is changing, the archaeology is changing, probably both of those things will prove to be pushed back a little bit earlier because you never find the earliest things uh, at any one time. And then at the same time, uh, some of the genetic analysis is indicating this is the time when, if you look at all the genes of all the humans living today, uh, they converge back around that same time. So the question that I want to ask in, in scene setting here is, uh, what is it that was happening to Homo sapiens? Uh, here is a representation over the two million years of human evolution, the genus Homo, uh, of various species and, and other uh, other authorities would give slightly different names to some of these species, but uh, only one of them became Homo sapiens <coughs> and then uh, uh, bred a little bit with uh, Neanderthals and, and Denisovans, uh, but basically dominated the Earth. What is special about us? Well, the great um, physical anthropologist from Germany, who uh, in the Germany they say he is the father of physical anthropology, was Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, and he was quoted uh, by Darwin as uh, having a real interest in domestication. And he said, man is far more domesticated than any other animal. And this was not a chance remark. He repeated essentially a version of this uh, probably a dozen times in his writings at different times. He was absolutely convinced that humans really are a domesticated animal. He was not an evolutionist. He, he uh, wrote before Darwin, but he, he did think that uh, probably uh, a benign god had made us uh, a domesticated species. And as you see at the bottom, many other people have had the same thought. And the essential reason for this is that uh, wild animals tend to be relatively aggressive and domesticated animals tend to be relatively calm and tolerant and cooperative with each other, uh, cooperative in the sense of not being aggressive, and, uh, and humans clearly fall into the latter category. And uh, this turns out to be, to be very true. Um, and and uh, for someone who studies chimpanzees, it's kind of dramatic. So here is an example of uh, an observation made by two anthropologists who spent uh, 17 years with the Ache foragers of Paraguay. And uh, what they observed uh, was that not once in that 17 years did they see so much as a scuffle among these men. Now that's a slight exaggeration of what happens on average, but uh, if you look at travelers' tales from the earliest contacts with all sorts of people around the world, or if you look at data nowadays from uh, all sorts of people around the world, the same thing is true which is that you can pack a lot of people into a room like this, or you can just observe them day by day, and if they were chimpanzees, they would probably have a squabble, and please don't behave like chimpanzees. But if you are just regular humans, then uh, we are all very relaxed. Let me give you an illustration of the kind of thing we see, not exactly on a daily basis, but you're never surprised to see it on a daily basis in chimpanzees. It's happening all the time. Ha <laughs> ha! 
Ivan wali So that is the reality of one of our closest relatives. And uh, even bonobos have got a, quite a high frequency of aggression, even though they are less violent in their aggression. And if we do some, some uh, sort of fairly rough approximations, uh, you can say that um, the amount of scuffling, the amount of just regular fighting that goes on uh, among chimpanzees compared to humans, uh, it's about a thousandth of the rate uh, uh, in humans compared to our cousin apes. So I think that, uh, that Blumenbach and Aristotle and Theophrastus and all sorts of people who made the claim that humans are like a domesticated animal are basically right. And as Margaret Mead said, both men and women are naturally dot, 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 are relatively unaggressive. Now what is so fascinating when uh, the Margaret Mead says that, that human aggression is like a domesticated animal, is, is that human anatomy is like a domesticated animal too. And when Helen Leach <laughs> put this together a few years ago, uh, what she did was to draw attention to four features in particular that differentiate domesticated animals from their wild ancestors. And you can now look at 15 or 20 different species of domesticated animals and see these kinds of trends. Domesticated animals compared to their ancestors have a short face, they have smaller teeth, you get feminization of the skull and the skeleton, and you get, very consistently, a reduction in the size of the brain. And humans have all those features, including, remarkably, the fact that in the last 30,000 years, uh, we've gotten, undergone a 10 to 15% reduction in brain size compared to those of our wild ancestors. Now, in all of these cases, there are individual interpretations of, of why this should be. You know, maybe we got small teeth in this phase because we were eating softer foods. Or maybe we got a brain reduction because uh, we had a, a reduction in body weight uh, at the same time, even though our height stayed the same. But what Helen Leach did was to say, if you put all these together, then this looks like a package. And furthermore, the package seems to be related to aggression. So what you see over time is that as you move from the earliest Homo sapiens on the left to uh, something much more modern, uh, you see a trend for uh, these um, changes to continue, the brow ridge reducing, the face becoming narrower. And let me just, just draw attention to the, the face becoming narrower. Men's face width turns out to be correlated with their circulating levels of testosterone. And uh, this uh, is illustrated here by a study which took uh, 20 men who had relatively high testosterone and 20 men who had relatively low testosterone and superimposed photographs uh, together to make the average face. And that's what you see. If you have high testosterone, you're more likely to be a wide-faced man than if you have low testosterone. And guess what? Facial width is correlated with aggression. And one study that really brings this home uh, is one of hockey players. So if you look at hockey players, uh, you can measure their facial width, and then you can see how aggressive they are by how often the referee puts them into the penalty box, <coughs> the sin bin. And here are data for uh, six different professional teams and six different college teams which show the same thing. The ones who have the slightly wider faces are the ones who spend more time in the penalty box. So, uh, you know, you can sort of start trying to pull this apart and and worry about uh, what's happening here in terms of the data. But here's another piece of data that supports this whole uh, fact that if you present people with photographs of relatively wide-faced or relatively narrow-faced individuals, men, then uh, they will, in test, respond unconsciously as if the ones who have wider faces are more likely to be aggressive. This is not true if they're given women, women's faces. So some human similarities to domesticated animals include the fact that we have a low frequency of aggression, that we've had anatomical changes for the last 300,000 years, which are similar to the changes in domesticated animals, 
And uh, the males are becoming more female-like, suggesting that we're reducing in the aggression of the sex that is more aggressive. Uh, and um, uh, these patterns are rather similar to the ones that we see in, in this case, wolves compared to, to dogs. So what is it that is linking aggression and anatomy? We have not known this for, for many years uh, until we go to Novozabirsk in Siberia and see the wonderful experiment by Dmitry Belayev with silver foxes. So Belayev was a geneticist who kept quiet during the Stalinist era because it was really dangerous to do Western-type science. His brother was actually murdered by Stalin because he tried to do that. But in the 1950s, he was able to become head of an institute and indulge himself in an experiment he'd long wanted to do, which was to find out if the reason that domesticated animals share various characteristics is because they have been reduced in aggression. So what he did was to start an experiment with foxes in which he chose to breed the foxes that were the least aggressive. The foxes were a good animal to do it from because all over Siberia there were people who were rearing foxes in a little mom and pop fox fur farms. And he was able to choose out of 400 males the one that was least aggressive. And he did this generation after generation. A very intense selection pressure. He did it by monitoring the young and scoring them for uh, how close they would allow an individual human to get to the fox. So you walk towards the fox and you write down the distance at which the fox says, ah! <coughs> the closest one is chosen for breeding. Within a few years, there was a new kind of domesticated animal. Some people took them into their homes and treated them as pets. The problem with doing that was that although they were greatly reduced in aggressiveness by this uh, strong selective breeding project, it didn't change their smell. But it did change uh, all sorts of other things as well. And here you see the person who carried on the project after uh, Belayev's death, <coughs> Ludmilla Trout in the middle, and who began their project with him. And here you are, uh, see them uh, holding a whole bunch of, of different foxes, all of which have been domesticated. There were parallel breeding experiments in the, in the same institute uh, with foxes that were not selected for the lack of aggression. Instead, they were selected either for uh, having a lot of aggression or they just weren't selected at all. So there were some nice controls for what they did. And what they found was that uh, in addition to a very rapid reduction in aggressiveness, which has continued to this day, there were also a lot of unselected consequences of selection for this low reactive aggression. So white patches on the fur are extremely dramatic because we all know that uh, there are white patches on the fur of all sorts of domesticated animals. Dogs and cats and goats and horses and cattle and so on. Not every individual has them. Not every breed has them. But scattered consistently through all the domesticated animals, you see that happening. Floppy ears, similar. Darwin said, this is such a mystery. Why is it that every species of domesticated animal has got some individuals that have floppy ears, and yet hardly any in the wild. There's only one kind of animal in the wild, he said, that has floppy ears. And you're probably aware that that is an elephant. So these items, these characteristics, white patches and floppy ears, and changes in the bones, and many other things, <coughs> are traits that we assemble together and we call the, in the domestication syndrome, the syndrome of of characteristics that happen when you domesticate an animal. And what Belayev and Trout showed in their work with foxes and rats, by the way, and mink, uh, these other animals that came in later, and now people are doing it with chickens and, uh, and with mice, you select against aggression in captivity and you get a domestication syndrome. And the domestication syndrome consists of two angles. One is the things that you're directly selecting the reduction in aggression, which is, goes along with a reduction in fear. 
and it goes along with a reduction in the stress response. So those are the selected traits. But then you also get these unselected traits. As I say, it's an unpredictable mixture. Every individual doesn't have all of the characteristics. Every species doesn't have all of the characteristics. But scattered very consistently through the individuals and the populations, you get white patches and floppy ears and curly tails. You get a lot of juvenilization of the features. You get a lot of uh, features that in the ancestral adult <coughs> um, would not have appeared, but they're in the ancestral juvenile, and they're retained into adulthood in uh, the subsequent species, such as, by the way, floppy ears, which are juvenile characteristic in many wild animals. And then you get a reduction in face length and, and the size of the teeth, a reduction in sex differences, which, as I said, is males becoming female-like, not females becoming male-like. And a reduction in brain size. And, and people are very keen on measuring brain size in the foxes to see, will they be a, a smaller brain by the time you finish breeding them? Uh, so far, it hasn't been definitely shown. Uh, there's a, an interesting wrinkle here, by the way, about the foxes, because when Belias started his breeding in 1958, those foxes had, in fact, already been in captivity since at least the 1920s, and some of them probably uh, about 10 or 15 years earlier, because they came from Canada. And there was a, a, a bubble of financial excitement because the fur of silver foxes was incredibly valuable. You could make fortunes with just uh, two or three animals. Uh, so in other words, they were in captivity earlier, and it may be the brain size uh, already uh, got reduced earlier. Anyway, it may be one of those unpredictable things. Still, they certainly show the domestication syndrome in general. Now, I think this has got all sorts of fascinating implications. And let me just mention one of them. Uh, which is that um, what we've seen here is that uh, there is selection against aggression in captivity, and it produces the domestication syndrome. You know, people did not know this until Belayev came along. People would see, dream up all sorts of reasons why there were white spots and floppy ears and short tails and all these things uh, in domesticated animals. <clears throat> but it was Belayev who showed that it was just one thing, selection against aggression. Well, if it's selection against aggression, why does it matter that it's in captivity? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you can get selection aggression against aggression in the wild, also producing a domestication syndrome. And uh, that idea has been tested. When we compare chimpanzees and bonobos, we compare two species very closely related to each other, which have an enormous difference in the amount of fighting and the amount of killing. Chimpanzees are much more aggressive than bonobos. I said earlier that they have roughly the same frequency of aggression. Bonobos are something like half as aggressive in terms of the number of aggressive episodes per day in the wild, according to Martin Serbeck, who's coming here <coughs> next uh, year to be a professor. But um, even though the bonobos <coughs> have a frequency of aggression that is somewhat similar to the chimpanzee. They are much less aggressive in terms of how much they hurt each other. So it turns out to be an astonishing thing that bonobos have the domestication syndrome in their bones. They have a short face, they have smaller teeth, they have a reduction in brain size, and they have reduced sex differences compared to chimpanzees. And it now looks as though we can think of bonobos as a self-domesticated form of a chimpanzee-like ancestor. We know from the genetic evidence that they've been separated for about a million years. And in the case of bonobos, we can start imagining why this has happened. Because nowadays, if a male loses his temper and goes completely mad and threatens a female bonobo, then she gives a quick call and other females rally to her cause and then they chase the male. And the reason the bonobos are able to do that on a very consistent basis is because they live in an ecology in which females are able to stay together on a very predictable and regular basis, which is not true for the chimpanzees. I think that what this suggests, this is the first case in which it's been really, uh, I think, um, relatively convincingly uh, argued that bonobos are self-domesticated, or that any wild animal is self-domesticated. I'm slightly self-conscious here. <clears throat> I'm, I'm part of the team that did this, you know, so I shouldn't sort of make too strong claims, I guess. Um, but I think what it, what it means is that uh, there are other species that are going to uh, end up showing the same thing. In fact, um, my expectation, 
uh, is that uh, you will find in, in many different lineages uh, that there are cases where you can argue that an animal has got relatively low uh, frequency of aggression or uh, relatively low intensity of aggression because of selection against it compared to uh, the ancestor and therefore that there will be the domestication syndrome. Uh, one of the cases in which this, one of the contexts in which this seems likely to happen is on islands where we know that, that uh, birds, uh, mammals, and rodents have all been shown to be less aggressive on islands than their continental varieties and uh, without anyone having done the sort of hard evidence, it looks as though the self-domestication syndrome, uh, the domestication syndrome, pops up quite repeatedly on islands. All of which I think is quite interesting because one of the things it means is that we've got to be very careful thinking that uh, the traits that we see in nature are necessarily adapted. They may be incidental consequences of adaptation for other reasons, coming as a domestication syndrome because of selection against aggression. Now, of course, why is there a domestication syndrome at all? I haven't given even a hint of an answer to that question. Uh, and um, we only still have, you know, hints, but um, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Adam Wilkins and Tecumseh Fitch and I have, uh, have explored the idea that uh, the reason that these features are tied together is because of very, very early events in the developing embryo that are necessary to produce the reduction in aggression and have, as incidental consequences, uh, tend to be associated with these other changes. So the selection for tameness goes to reduced stress response, and that is caused, we think, by a reduced migration of these particular cells, the neural crest cells, a tissue that happens just after, uh, is formed just after gastrulation, I mean, in humans, it was sort of between two and three weeks of age, uh, and, uh, and then sort of does weird things and kind of disappears. And it will produce, in this case, smaller adrenals. And as an incidental consequence, we know that neural crest cell migration is responsible for producing white patches. Uh, we think it's responsible for producing floppy ears. We know it's responsible for producing smaller brains in some experimental animals and so on. So we don't know yet uh, really exactly what's going on but there's some fascinating biology starting to tease us apart, and we've now got uh, six or seven species of domesticated animals in which the neural crest cell hypothesis looks pretty good in terms of the genetic changes compared to the wild ancestor. Well, having said that, <laughs> let me sort of just leave that on, and you can uh, uh, read the book uh, about it. Um, but let me turn to the, the sort of you know, fascinating question of uh, if humans self-domesticated, how did it happen? And here I want to come back to the, the problem of aggression and the goodness paradox, the paradox of, of being, on the one hand, um, relatively unaggressive, and on the other hand, uh, rather aggressive. And the essential solution that has is, is been staring us in the face for, for decades, actually, is that instead of one type of aggression, which is kind of what's been assumed by people in anthropology and philosophy and, and uh, there's many people thinking about this area, there are two types of aggression. Well, okay, you know, maybe in the end there'll be more. But two types sure seem to characterize or to capture a lot of the variation. So one kind is proactive, instrumental, premeditated, planned variation. And the other is the emotional and reactive. And the point about this is that these are differently controlled in terms of their biology, and therefore they can be on different evolutionary tracks. So reactive aggression is where you suddenly lose your temper when some jerk that you've met in the bar uh, says that your mother is a fill-in-the-blank. Which leads to the most common type of murder in the United States, which is uh, two strangers meeting outside the bar on the, uh, in the car park and having a fight, and one of them pulls out a knife or a gun. So that's reactive aggression. Uh, very highly aroused, and uh, you tend to be angry with everybody around you. Proactive aggression is calmer, it's deliberate. There might be high arousal in dealing with proactive aggression, but uh, it, in general what's happening is that the individuals or the group has got a consistent aim that they want to, to uh, solve, uh, to, to get something or to kill somebody, uh, and once they've done that, then uh, they can finish their aggressive episode. Now, we've seen that humans are very low in reactive aggression compared to chimpanzees, but what about proactive aggression? Well, here is <coughs> data uh, brought together by 
Lawrence Keeley some years ago and, and then added to with our chimpanzee data. And uh, what each column represents is a particular society with a rate of death in intergroup aggression, which in the case of these different human cultures is war. And so what you see is there's a lot of variation among the different cultures, but if you put it all together, the median uh, is uh, somewhere in the uh, sort of 0.4 range, uh, the percent of population killed per year in intergroup aggression, and uh, chimpanzees are in the same order of magnitude as the humans. Uh, incidentally, the industrial societies are interesting here because they include uh, the um, cases of uh, Germany and Russia and Japan going through World War I and World War II. So even though we think of that as simply appalling death rates, they are actually lower than the estimates for a series of uh, societies and chimpanzees. Well, animals have uh, both proactive and reactive aggression. Uh, on the bottom right here, uh, you see an example of an individual that was killed uh, using proactive aggression by uh, uh, the chimpanzees that I study. So our group killed this guy. And um, a very important feature of proactive aggression uh, is illustrated by what happens when chimpanzees do this. So chimpanzees, uh, on average, uh, eight individuals kill one victim at a time. So that means they have overwhelming power. And the result is that even though you've got a victim who is fighting for his life, and he's three or four times as strong as a human, he can't touch the ones who are trying to kill him. So in this particular case, this victim uh, was uh, lying there with cuts all over the ventral side of his body. His thorax had been torn out. One testicle was under his body, and another one was five meters away. And the eight who attacked him, not one of them had a scratch. That is because one individual can grab a hand, another can grab a foot, and hand and foot. He's immobilized, and the rest can just do the damage. And the point about proactive aggression is that if it's done right, and animals do tend to do it right, the aggressors don't get hurt. So it's very different from reactive aggression in that way, because in reactive aggression, both sides tend to get hurt. But one of them gets hurt worse. Okay, so... Um, the uh, proactive and, and uh, reactive distinction uh, has been known in many ways for some time, but only recently people really got to grips with the neurobiology. And they know that it's part of the attack circuit in the brain that is responsible for activating uh, aggression. Uh, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the periactual gray are part, different parts of the brain which are all involved. But what turns out to be the case is that in proactive aggression, the particular parts of those subregions of the brain are different from the particular parts that are involved in reactive aggression. It's biology. This is all probably familiar to you from the point of thinking about the law. You know, we know that if uh, a man kills when he finds his wife in bed with another man, then he is likely to be forgiven by a jury in a way that a deliberate, planned, uh, intended aggression is not. So. First-degree murder is, tends to be proactive, and second-degree murder tends to be reactive, and we differentiate those. There are all sorts of ways in which these have been separated. Uh, uh, here we've got <clears throat> five different areas of science that have distinguished these two types of aggression, but it hasn't, until now, been brought into evolutionary anthropology, this distinction. So what I'm telling you is that it's pretty clear that human aggressiveness can be differentiated between a low propensity for reactive aggression and a high propensity for proactive aggression compared to our relatives. So we can start imagining how these have happened in uh, evolutionary time with uh, humans having this uh, great difference in terms of the low reactive aggression from our cousin apes, uh, but similar to chimpanzees uh, and less than bonobos uh, with the proactive aggression. I want to focus in my remaining time on the low propensity for reactive aggression. What is it that favored this? And just as we can ask with bonobos, what is it nowadays when you see a male who is too aggressive that stops him from being aggressive? And in that case, it was the females. We can ask what happens in hunters and gatherers when they have to deal with persistent aggressors. Because although hunters and gatherers are famously peaceful, and I've emphasized that point earlier. Nevertheless, 
if you read the ethnographies, you will find some individuals who sometimes just go against the norms. They are people who just won't be stopped. They are jerks, and they are men. So here you've got a tiny little camp where people are living in extremely close quarters all the time. It's a very socially claustrophobic atmosphere. And somebody thinks it's really funny to put rotten eggs in someone else's clothes. Or worse, to grab the meat when somebody comes in with it and take it all for himself and only dish it out to those that he likes. Or to come into someone's hut at night and kick one man out and say, I'm going to sleep with your wife tonight. Uh, or to put an arrow into somebody that he doesn't like. These things happen. And the question is, what do you do about it? And depending on what's happening, of course, uh, the, these personality traits will tend to, to stay there for some time. You, the people start out by just cajoling them. They might ostracize them which is very, very painful if you're living in one of these small communities. Nobody will pay any attention to you. These sorts of things will normally bring him into line. They might ridicule him. Who do you think you are, big boots? Sometimes my people might get to the desperate point of just making a plan to walk out in the middle of the night. He wakes up in the next day and he's all on his own. But of course, it's easy enough for him just to track him and join him again. Say, hi, <laughs> great. So there's no police, there's no prisons, there's nobody to, hold, to help except you're just on your own. And what do you do if a guy is a total jerk and in the end just absolutely persists in getting his way? Because he is a physically domineering individual who is prepared to fight anybody. Remember that movie of the chimps? The alpha male chimp is the alpha male so long as he can personally, physically defeat any other chimpanzee in combat. And on the day when he is beaten by one other individual, he is no longer alpha male and he never will be again. But that is a system that happens in all the primates except humans. Individual physical fighting ability won't work. The ultimate sanction in humans is execution. In hunters and gatherers, in every continent of the world, they are known to execute individual men who are too assertive, who use their physical strength to try and bully in the way that a chimpanzee male would. So here's an example from the, the harmless people, as Elizabeth Marshall Thomas quite rightly called them. That was their name for themselves, the Juhansi of Southern Africa. A guy gets, uh, he's already killed three people, and the community decides to kill him. And it says here, fatally wounded him in full daylight. He died. And then everybody came along and put an arrow into his body. They wanted to symbolically be part of, yeah, we all did it together. And this is fairly typical. Here is Christopher Bohm, who's done all the hard work in reading 120 ethnographies of hunters and gatherers and finding out about the general patterns. The typical domination episode involves a male who seriously intimidates people at the level of lethal threat and then is dispatched. And the interesting thing about his being dispatched by his own male kinsman shows how carefully this is thought out because what they don't want to do is for uh, A to kill B and then B's relatives say, well, I know you sort of you know, you needed to do it, but he's our kin, so we're going to have to kill someone on your side. Avoid that revenge scenario by getting the male kin to do the killing in the first place. What is it that differentiates humans from chimpanzees in this respect? I've said already that chimpanzees can kill members of neighboring groups. I showed you a picture of it. They sometimes kill members of their own groups. But what they don't show any evidence of doing is having a plan to kill members of their own groups. And that's tricky. It's tricky to get involved in a fight with people in your own group because you don't know who's going to be a, an ally on what side. And it's tricky enough with humans. I mean, imagine that you think there's someone in your group who's a real jerk, and you say, wouldn't it be great to send him back to the witches? And so you say to your pal, you know, I think it'd be 
great idea to drop a rock on this guy's head in the middle of the night. And the pal says, sure. But then he goes off to the jerk and says, you know what my friend was talking about? He's talking about offing you. In other words, it's a very difficult, problematic scenario. And you need to be able to communicate in very much more sophisticated ways than chimpanzees can. So if we're going to think about what it is that's responsible for humans having this apparently universal tendency, we have to go to not just language, but a sophisticated form of language, which enables a group of men in the group, a subgroup of men, to conspire and form a plan that they are comfortable with. And it's still you know, tricky nowadays. I mean, when, um, when Caesar's assassins came to kill him, they'd been conspiring and planning for weeks. And yet, at the time they were going to do it, there was all of a sudden nervousness about whether or not they could actually go through with it. Because what if you made the first move and then everyone else decided, well, no, we decided to change our minds. And it was two brothers who did it first. It's a tricky business, but if you can organize it, then you move into a world in which you can do it safely. It's just like those chimpanzees killing an individual in a brutal way without any scratch on themselves. That is the way that proactive aggression works in humans. And as a particularly hideous example, think about Auschwitz. Think about the concentration camps, where people were killed in huge numbers, and the killers did not get killed. In the case of our ancestors, starting more than 300,000 years ago, I think we should reconstruct that our species became different from others, our lineage, because language became sufficiently sophisticated that they could have conspiracies leading to the safe, proactive killing of the tyrants, the previous alpha male types. And that led to self-domestication. And then you get a whole series of other things that happen. One of them is that our societies are famously egalitarian, which really means among the males. It doesn't so much mean between the males and the females, I'm sorry to say. But, but if you look at the social relationships in small-scale societies, it's, it's a fiercely egalitarian among the males. No male can exert authority over others. And certainly they can't uh, do it based on physical fighting ability unless they do it for a few weeks at a time before they're executed. Of course, one of the great things about having uh, reduced aggression in the group is that uh, people find it easier to cooperate with each other. And so I think a lot of the cooperation that you see so famously in humans is an incidental consequence of selection against reactive aggression. One of the kinds of, of cooperation uh, is uh, patriarchal. What you see in small-scale societies is there are a series of rules and laws and religious beliefs and, uh, and other social norms in which somehow the men come out on top. And if women do the wrong thing, if women by mistake see the sacred trumpets of the men or walk on the paths that the men have assigned to be male-only paths, then they can get killed. There is a striking amount of um, evidence of the exertion of power by the male coalitions, even in the small-scale societies where uh, outright fighting hardly ever happens at all. And uh, like Christopher Boehm, I think that uh, one of the consequences of uh, the power of the men in general uh, is that it is a path into understanding uh, why humans have got moral emotions that differ from the moral emotions that you see in animals. And the big difference is that humans really take choices to invest in the group. You know, our moral senses are partly self-serving and partly directed towards uh, helping the group aims. Well, imagine in these kind of claustrophobic, dangerous societies, uh, if you are a non-conformist and say, I don't want to uh, you know, do something to help the group, I, I'll just keep my, my meat for myself. Well, you do that too often and people start whispering about you and then the ultimate sanction can come through. Well, the um, overall uh, points I've been making <laughs> are twofold. First of all, there is the paradox. How did we evolve to be at both ends of the supposed 
scale of aggression simultaneously. And what I've argued is that we should be thinking not of a single scale of aggression, but of two. We have reactive aggression, in which we're very much at the low end, and we have proactive aggression, in which we're very much at the high end. We're not quite as bad as wolves, in which something more like 40% of all adults get killed by proactive aggression from other wolves. But nevertheless, we are definitely one of the top species. So that gives a sense of uh, the, the source of our, our good and evil, I hope. And then uh, why is it that one species of, of Homo became sapiens? I think that, uh, that Freud was right. I only learned about this uh, this week, uh, this quote from Sigmund Freud, that human life in communities only becomes possible when a number of men unite together in strength superior to any single individual and remain united against all single individuals. That is what no other mammal does. And you need to have a sophisticated form of language to be able to do it. So I think that it's uh, when the mysterious origins of sophisticated language uh, can be better understood that we will understand the solution to uh, those two big problems about why uh, on the one hand we are so relatively peaceful and on the other hand uh, why uh, we evolved uh, the domestication syndrome. I've focused quite a lot this evening on uh, the parallels with domestication which I think are just totally intriguing and I think that uh, it's a really wonderful time to be thinking about this because the genetic revolution is going to give real possibilities for understanding how human changes compared to, not our ancestors, but good models for ancestors, Neanderthals and Denisovans, uh, how those human changes are instantiated uh, compared to the genetic changes in domesticated animals. And already we're beginning to see a little bit of evidence about that. But even though I've been focusing on, on reactive aggression and how, you know, how great we are, nobody's fault this evening. Nevertheless, I just want to emphasize in a sort of slightly gloomy way that the mixture does remain. And, and I think that we need to continue to grapple with the fact that uh, we come from a lineage in which proactive aggression has been very important. And uh, it continues to be a serious threat. The nice news about proactive aggression is that unlike reactive aggression, individuals are not expected to indulge in it if they are themselves going to get hurt. What that means translated into the big areas of international politics you know, has yet to be worked out. But nevertheless, I think that it's very important to, to hold in, in, in parallel these two ideas, that on the one hand, we're a delightful, tolerant, cooperative, unaggressive species, but on the other hand, our capacity for danger looks very much like something that we've inherited from our great ape ancestry. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the fact that I've had huge numbers of people uh, with whom I interact with uh, developing this story. Uh, the ones I've put here are the most important ones uh, who have actually been at Harvard uh, during, during that time. Thank you very much. <laughs>